Hi everyone, how's it going? I'm Mayan and uh, I'm with Med School Coach today and I wanted to chat a little bit about uh, USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 prep. Um, but before we get started, how many of you have taken Step 1? Okay, and anyone taken Step 2? Okay, so anyone who's taking Step 1 in the next few months? Okay, and then what about step two? All right, so it looks like a pretty even divide, so I'll talk about a little bit of step one prep as well as step two prep. Um, but to get started, a bit about me, graduated from Penn, uh, went to med school at Hopkins, uh, not too far from here, and then I'm currently a resident uh, at Harvard Plastic Surgery um, at BIDMC. So today I wanna talk a bit about Step one, how important that is, what you have to do, and how well you have to prepare for that to be in a good spot for step two. And then, of course, how do you do well in step two now that it's not pass-fail anymore, or now that step one's pass-fail, step two is a score, and you have to, uh, you don't have a step one score to really know where you were at, okay? So, and then I think the most important thing is how to prepare well, how you should plan your study schedule, and then specific test-taking tips. And I want to make this a bit informal. So uh, if you guys have questions at any point, just raise your hand. And uh, we can kind of go from there. And I'll also have some built-in Q&A session. So uh, like, take notes if you have any questions. And we'll get those answered for sure. Uh, so does step one matter anymore? Well, yes, it is important. And the reason is you can't do step two if you don't do step one. And if step one is... Uh, not done well often, uh, people have trouble starting off at step two. Um, so typically what I recommend to my students is prepare about the same time you would have prepared if step one is, was a score, okay? And that is typically about a two months dedicated, but also preparing uh, throughout um, your uh, preclinical time. And you know, a lot of times the two months may not even be enough if you haven't prepared through preclinical time, but if you're prepared really well during a preclinical time, maybe you need, you know, six weeks or one month instead. So it really depends on what you've done. And we'll talk about what you should be doing and where you should be um, for each of these things. Uh, and yep, it, it's the building blocks of medical knowledge. And uh, there's some studies that show pretty good correlation of step two success with step one. The new role of step two, well, just taking over step one. So you're not off the hook quite yet. Um, and the good thing about that is step two is less memorization. It's more clinically focused, things that you would actually use in residency and as an attending, um, more so than a lot of factoids in step one that you just have to remember for the sake of it. Um, and what makes this hard, right, is this is high stakes. So you, this is your first really important exam since the MCAT. And I know there's some BSMD programs where people don't even take the MCAT. So this can be like a really big exam for some people. Um, so that definitely adds nerves and uh, we want uh, you to be very well prepared for that. Um, and it is a bit longer than step one. It's an hour longer, it's eight blocks instead of seven blocks. Uh, and the thing with step two is since all the test prep companies were focused on step one because that was really the most important exam uh, for residency admissions, you know, probably about three to four years ago. Now they're still catching up for step two, and uh, the step two score range is a lit uh, a bit more broad than step one. Um, and by that I mean, you know, getting a you know a two forty versus a two fifty is not as different compared to step one, where two forty and two fifty were quite a bit more separated. So. Um, the scores are blended in a bit more. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. So this is the stage I think most of you guys are here today. What should I do before dedicated? Okay, there's step one dedicated and step two dedicated. So I call this pre-dedicated. And I think the most important thing here is to actually start thinking about these exams. So dedicated doesn't mean the only time you study for these exams because that's when you hear of people saying, oh my God, I'm not ready, I need to delay a month, or it's impossible to cover all these resources in the time my school has given me. And I do agree with that. It's very hard to cover everything in 
you know, one month or two months if you haven't really been doing these resources. Um, and with the schools, uh, they have specific exams. It's kind of tailored more towards what faculty uh, want to teach and their research interests. So it's not really tailored as well for USMLE exams. So I think it's all the more important to kind of follow the USMLE curriculum while you're doing um, your preclinical work. So if you're learning about the GI system, you should also say for step one, follow along with first aid, make sure you understand the first aid content for step one. And do some actual practice you have USMLE questions every week. You know, you don't need to do full blocks of 40, but even if you do like 10 questions a day during preclinical, that just helps you see what type of content they're testing. Um, and at this point, a pre-dedicated content review is really important. This is where you really want to understand the content. You still should do questions. It doesn't mean no questions. I think you should still do some questions. And then once we get to dedicated, that's going to completely switch over to a lot of more questions. And even the content review will be through questions. OK, so making the most of this time. So the pre-dedicated, OK, so for step one, that's all your basically organ system blocks. And then step two, it's your rotations and shelf. That's the pre-dedicated time. So what I'd recommend is before you even start your time or starting like you know this weekend, figure out approximately when you're going to take step one or step two. So if it's like three months away, uh, you know you make a certain plan kind of going backwards from your exam. If it's a year away, you can still make a plan. And part of that is just scheduling. And by scheduling, I think the most important thing is to see how much time you have and what content you have to cover. Okay, so for step one, a lot of people realize that they work, they, they learn really well through Anki. So there's a lot of Anki decks out there. We'll talk about Anki. But there's so many cards, how can you do all of them well in a certain amount of time, right? You have to start scheduling early on. So if there is nine months, you would kind of divide the cards you want to cover over that nine months. And then you'll look at the different say Boards and Beyond or Pathoma videos, all these videos that you want to cover before dedicated, and you uh, kind of piece them in together at that point. So scheduling is important. You kind of have that schedule on top of your school exams, um, and especially after your school exams, you have a little bit more time. I know the week before it can get pretty bad, so um, you know put all of that together. Uh, let's keep going here. So yeah, this is you know you want to get a systemic or a systematic approach to studying. Uh, you want to see what works well for you, what doesn't work so well for you. Um, and at this point, figure out which resources you want to use. And I'll talk about some resources here, um, but I think it's really important to pick a few resources and stick with those resources uh, as much as you can all the way through. So there's so many different things you can do, and I think the biggest issue I see with students coming in uh, and struggling and plateauing is that they're using like 10 resources, kind of trying to cover everything, but it's just really not possible to cover that many resources um, and do it well. So I think a couple of resources that everyone, like absolutely everyone needs to use is like UWorld and NBMEs. So UWorld, those are probably some of the most representative questions in a large question bank online that you'll get. And you want to shoot to review that whole question deck. Uh, for both step one and step two. And for step two, you would have already reviewed it um, quite a bit through your shelf exams, hopefully, and then you do a second pass uh, for step two. And then with the NBMEs, they have uh, practice exams, right? There's called self-assessments. Uh, they have them for step one and step two. Uh, definitely want to do all of them and really understand those questions well. A lot of them can actually be repeated almost word for word on the real exam. Um, and you may feel like some of the questions are kind of weird, not what you're completely used to, but the real exam also has those questions. Uh, and then other supplemental resources for questions, say AMBOSS, it's also a great resource for um, reading quickly on some topics. Uh, so it's a more up-to-date, uh, comprehensive version of uh, first aid kind of built in. And then actual resources for reviewing. Uh, so first aid, I recommend it for step one. Step two, not as good for. Okay, step two version isn't, uh, it's not as content based the exam, so the actual book isn't 
as helpful. So I don't think I would recommend it at all for that. But Pathoma and Boards and Beyond, great for step one. Um, I think that you should pick one or the other and go through it from beginning to end. And then Sketchy, uh, Sketchy has multiple different products. So they have Sketchy, like Pathology, Micro, Farm. Uh, I think Micro is probably their best and most useful product. Uh, recommend that for step one. And then Pharmacology, Sketchy Farm is also wonderful. Uh, I think those two are the best for that. And then as far as step two, if you did Sketchy for step one, that should pretty much set you up well for Micro. Questions can cover the rest. Uh, Boards and Beyond, they have a version for step two. Again, not as good as the one for step one, but I still recommend it. It's not as comprehensive, but gives you a really good foundation. So something I'd recommend doing you know, before dedicated and something you can watch during your uh, shelves. So incorporating practice questions. I think this is some of the most important uh, things to do here. Um, the thing is, you can never really start questions too early. So I would start questions as soon as you can, um, both like in your pre-dedicated period. This basically means within a few months of starting med school. Once you're done with you know, the orientation and stuff and you're learning actual organ blocks, this is gonna be very important to do. And then you're going to be doing this for your shelf, so that's usually much much better. For step two, you're, pretty, you're more prepared and that's typically why uh, people spent less time on step two in the past because you've already done most of the questions. And one of the most important things is not just doing the questions, but how you review them. And this is, if there's something you kind of take away today uh, about specific like studying tips, I think this is it here. So when you do a question, you don't want to read the explanation after you get it wrong, okay? You don't want, that's not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is you actually redo the question kind of with a fresh mind, okay? So you read the scenario, go through the choices, and answer it as if you know the right answer isn't right there. And if you see yourself coming across the same answer that you put before, which is the wrong answer, or another wrong answer, there's a problem there, right? And the problem is probably with your content. Um, you didn't understand the topic that the question was testing. So you still don't read the explanation then. At that point, you go learn about that topic. So go to step one, you can go to first day. If it's step two, maybe AMBOSS or the Boards and Beyond video, okay? Uh, look at that video, learn about the topic, five, 10 minutes, then you come back, okay? So once you come back, you know that content, you do the question again, and you should get the right answer. Uh, if you don't, probably still didn't read the content right. But then you kind of, after that, the best thing to do is then you read the explanation, okay? So that's if this is a content error. Now, a lot of times, we don't miss questions just because we don't know the actual topic, right? And that's something the most, one of the most annoying things, right? You do like a practice exam, you go through all the questions, and then you're reviewing them and you realize that like, oh, I shouldn't have gotten a, I wish I didn't, make these silly mistakes, I really could have been, you know, scoring a 75% instead of a 65%. And that can be really frustrating, right? So I think this is one of the most important areas uh, that you can work on. And the way you do that is first identify which questions are for test taking. So if you do the question again, you know, without time, you kind of with a clear mind and, you know, not rushing through, you're going to hopefully get the right answer the next time, okay? That kind of tells you that, oh, during the pressure of the test taking, the time running, or just exhaustion, you're missing something. You have to figure out what that is and classify it, okay? So there are a couple of common reasons, right? So one is you're rushed, uh, other is you didn't really understand the question right. You kind of skipped over it, you know, looked at different chunks. Another possibility is you skipped right to the answers and that influenced you before you even properly read the question. Um, and then after you figure out what that reason is, I usually like jot it down. So first you say, hey, is it a content error, test taking error? You can put a C or a T. And if it's a test taking error, uh, you can jot down, you know, why, okay? And then how do you prevent this error, right? So how do you prevent this in the future? Well, if it's timing, well, you know, it's gonna be more about pacing. So I say, make sure you 
go through the first 10 questions in 15 minutes. And that makes sure you're on pace. Because in the beginning, you don't feel that pressure of time. You're like, I have so much time left, right? So after the first, if you're on pace the first 15 or first 10 questions, you're most likely going to be on pace the rest of the exam. So I think that's one of the big things uh, for um, comprehension. It might just be starting reading the question slowly because we often get excited and try to rush through it. So reading it slowly and uh, you know reading it once instead of reading it five times fast is often helpful, right? And the other thing is just don't look at the answer choice to begin with. Always start with the question, picture the scenario. Um, you know, if it says it's a 42-year-old man in the ED, picture an actual 42-year-old man in the ED. That way you don't pick a choice that applies to someone who likely won't that get, you know, has dementia and won't get that condition until maybe they're 70 or something that's applicable only to like a little kid, right? So a lot of times just picturing the patient helps. Um, and yeah, do not get discouraged, right? The school exams are different. If you did well in school exams, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do well on USMLE. If you didn't do too well on school exams, doesn't mean that you can't ace uh, the USMLEs. Um, you know, use these questions as a learning tool and uh, just keep pushing through. It, it gets better. It gets better. You're going to have plateaus. I don't know anyone I've worked with who has not had a plateau. I plateaued several times, and it's it, it will happen, but you'll get over it. Just know that, okay? Uh, and when should you take this exam, right? So for step one, I recommend that you pass at least two full practice exams. And ideally, you're not in the low pass range, but you're in the pass range, OK? So something about 70% is the number I like to shoot for for most of my students. And then uh, step two, it's a little easier to predict because you've, you get numbers right after your exams. So uh, I think that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, and then at a certain point, you're going to realize that your score isn't really improving too much. And the more you do, it may not really help. And there's a fine line because you can burn out pretty quickly. Uh, you know, you're studying 12 hours a day, sometimes 15, and you know, a light day, maybe seven or eight hours, and that's all you're doing. It's rough. So that catches up to you. And especially at step one, at a certain point, every time you're trying to cram in more information, you'll realize you're losing other information and you're at a point where you're saturated. That's also probably a sign that you probably should take your exam pretty quickly. Um, so delaying is good if you have tangible things that you know that you can do to improve. But uh, don't delay because you feel like you can always do better. Because you'll feel that even if you're at a point where you can ace the exam. There's, you'll never get that feeling where I'm 100% ready. So just kind of know that here. And then let's talk a bit about resources here. So yeah, we talked a bit about this. I'm going to skip through. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about question banks. How to use question banks. Okay, so there's, so one thing I want to throw out there is there's a question bank called the USMLE RX. That question bank is paired very well uh, with first aid and it's a step one resource. Um, but the questions aren't very much USMLE style. They're more about, did you remember this fact in first aid? And they'll have a question just surrounded on it, surrounded by it. So I don't recommend that resource. I really recommend for questions only UWorld, AMBOSS, and NBME questions, OK? Uh, and always try to work in time mode when you're practicing, uh, especially during dedicated. Uh, the pressure really helps. It gets you used to it. Um, and doing subject versus random questions. I recommend you do random questions at least a minimum of one block a day during dedicated, both step one and step two, and ideally two blocks. And depending on where you're at uh, with your subjects, so say you take a practice exam, you realize, let's say, GI, HEMONC, and uh, endocrine are really low. You may want to incorporate some subject-specific questions. And the way I do that is you do a block of 15 questions. Okay see which ones you get wrong, and then right away review all those topics in first aid uh, or um, you know, watch the videos uh, for boards and beyond, and then cover all those gaps, and then take another block of 15 questions right away. And 
hopefully by then you'll be a lot more confident reviewing all that in just that one subject area and you'd hopefully be like, okay, I'm going to do much better in that. And say that doesn't work out as well. You improve a little bit and you can do that again. And that will quickly narrow into which part of that subject uh, you're weaker in. And then let's see here for actual resources. Yeah, we talked a bit about this, but if you guys want to take note of this, so you world NBMEs, Emboss, great for both step one, step two. Um, Sketchy Farm, I think you can really use it for both step one and step two. Sketchy Micro is great for step one, as well as Petoma and First Aid, Boards and Beyond for both. And then there's this resource called Online MedEd, which used to be free, and then about a year ago, they started charging people for it, but still great. I recommend it, especially for rotations. Um, can be helpful, another helpful resource. And some other like auxiliary resources. The Divine Intervention podcasts are really nice. You know, if you're driving somewhere or just going on a walk, great to listen to the side. Uh, there's some YouTube channels. One of them is Dirty Medicine. Uh, Med School Coach also has a ton of content um, you can check out. And the other two are step one resources. So 100 Anatomy Concepts is like a long slide deck uh, that's actually uh, puts in most of the anatomy content that you need to know. So if you Google that, I think on Reddit, you know, you can download that. And then Onking is a great step one resource. Uh, I don't recommend going through the whole deck at this point. It keeps getting bigger every day. And I think now they're up to like 50 or 60,000 cards. Uh, I think the most useful cards are the ones that correspond to uh, Sketchy Micro, uh, Sketchy Farm, and Biochemistry, uh, because those are the memorization heavies. And I would generally kind of avoid the rest because there's so many other things out there. If you just stick with these, uh, you'll be good to go. And practice exams. How many should I take? Well, you want to take all the NBMEs. And for step one, also the two URL self-assessments. For step two, uh, just the second one I'd recommend. The first one, um, not as representative, but it's great as practice, but at least take the second URL self-assessment for step two. And let's see here. Well, the other thing that makes it hard preparing with USMLE is everyone does it differently. You hear someone does well, and they use a certain resource, and then you say, oh, they use that, so I must use that, and then I'll do really well. The thing with that is it's hard to really know why someone did so well. It's not really just one specific resource. It's really how they used the resources they had. Like I know people who just use UWorld and scored, you know, above a 260 on step two. I also know people who used so many different resources and even looked at their school exam notes and also scored that. So like you really don't know why they did that well. And the reason is, is because everyone studies differently. So you have to figure out something that works for you. Well, I wanted to stop for about a few minutes here and see any questions so far about what we've covered. Yeah, in the back. I suggest the onking for step two. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question was, how about onking for step two? So step two, as you probably know, there's not as much memorization content. So every time you're spending time using a resource, that's time that could be spent elsewhere, right? So for step two, I think that there's certain areas that uh, you don't remember as well. So for example, pediatrics, there's a lot of, you know, milestones and, you know, vaccinations and all of that stuff, right? Guidelines. Just unlock those cards and just do those, right? Um, family medicine, there's a lot of memorization stuff. Just unlock those cards and do it. There's no point doing all the cards, like no point doing cardiovascular system cards. That's a lot more physiology and you learn a lot better through questions. Um, step one's a bit different. You know, you could really include quite a bit more. But for step two, I think it's okay, like, as a resource only for certain areas. I really wouldn't use it much for your dedicated time. But during your rotations, you know, great, I think. I was uh, just going to follow up with what about for shelves? You do suggest it for shelves, shelf exams. So I, I, I think it's only the memorization heavy parts, right? So uh, I think the women's health rotation, there's you know, quite a few guidelines. Family medicine is the main one. You probably want to use it in. And then uh, some in pediatrics. Uh, I 
don't think you really need it much for surgery and medicine. I think that's a lot more physiology and a lot more questions will be where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do I use like anything that Yeah. So the number one thing is making sure uh, you're doing your reviews and you're doing an appropriate number of cards. So if you're doing a bunch of new cards, but you're not reviewing them, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the memory tool. Because it's the memory works by seeing things multiple times over a period of time, right? So it's about repetition. And I really think it's hard to do the whole deck effectively. And especially since your goal is not to get like a 270 on step one, because you can't even get a 270 on step one anymore. You want to just get the important bits and pieces. So I think to be effective, um, Focus on the memorization heavy things. Okay, so the way I'd recommend it is you do your sketchy videos. Okay, so watch a few videos. Unlock the cards just for those videos. Okay, and then I wouldn't ever do more than about 80 to 100 cards a day because then your reviews pile up so fast. So you really want to look maybe a month in advance and divide how many you want to cover over that month. Okay, so I think that um, hopefully that answers your question a bit better. But they also have tags for like boards and beyond and so forth. Yeah. yeah so when you're studying for step one, will you start with birds like micro, far, or do you like, combine? Or do you, like, like, what do you start with first? Yeah, yeah. It's like, where, where do I start, right? So I think the best place to start is if uh, you know, you're currently in medical school, right? And you're going through the subject that you're learning. Start with that subject. So learn the step content for that specific subject. OK? And then you would have covered quite a bit. And then say you have vacation, you have some time, go back to stuff that you've covered, you, you haven't covered before, right? And then so I, I would do all that. And then there's sketchy form, sketchy micro. I would try to cover all of that and the Anki cards for it before you start your dedicated. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you recommend um, for step two any subjects specific in BME or just general? Um, so I would do all the general ones, okay? If you haven't taken the shelves, you know, if you're an IMG or something like that, then uh, I think they can be useful, but they generally are a little bit easier than the non-subject specific ones. Um, so I, I don't think they're representative, but they're, you know, they're an okay resource if you finish all the other questions. Yeah. What percentages should we be shooting for in our question banks? Um, for step one or step two? Both. Both, okay. So for like step one, I would say like if you're, you know, you're gonna start low, okay? Most people will start around 40%, 30%, you know, 50%, and it's gonna go up, right? So it doesn't assess where you're at, but when you're towards, like closer towards the end of your study period, you know, if you're, you know, scoring in the, you know, 70s most of the time, you're pretty good to pass. But obviously, the they're not scoring tools, okay? So it doesn't really predict that much. You really want to look for more for improvement over time. Um, and I really wouldn't use that as like a good guide to how well you're doing. It's really about those practice exams. So really use it as almost like an interactive textbook is the way I would say. What resources or video resources do you recommend for the basic sciences, like biochem, except for micro and farm, which are this is sketch? Yeah. Well, for like neurology, medics. Yeah, I. So I really liked um, boards and beyond. Uh, I think it kind of just was very organized and got through pretty much all the content you could, and this is obviously I think more towards step one that you're asking for. Uh, for the topics I didn't quite understand, uh, I like Pathoma because they go through it much slower and uh, you know not as in depth, but it's easier to understand. So I kind of used Boards and Beyond as my blueprint and Pathoma for areas that I wanted to learn better or didn't understand the first go. I do use boards and the end card, but in any like sometimes it's easy to zone out when like doing videos. How do you like actually do this and like you know? 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent question, right? How do you actively listen when you have these videos, right? Because they do, it's like a lecture. You, you don't watch too many videos at once. That's that's one thing. And two is after I watch like two or three videos, I would go through the hunky cards for that video, okay, to make sure you're paying attention. And then another great thing for active learning is once you're done with the video, you should be able to summarize or teach someone what you learned in that video. So remember what the topics are. So if you're thinking, okay, I need to teach someone what topics this video on, how am I gonna teach them? You'll automatically pay attention. So ask yourself questions too. So ask yourself questions about the topic. I mean, it's really interesting, right? You're, you wanna be a doctor, right? What is happening here? So, you know, why, how is this disease affecting our body, why, right? And if you just ask yourself questions, that also is a way to keep engaged. And I think really if you start doing more than three or four videos in one sitting, you're gonna tune out. Like it just, our brains aren't really wired to focus that long for you know a single task. So switch tasks. Um, we'll do more questions later, but I wanna get through a few more slides here. Um, so just some timing things. Okay, so should you study uh, for step two throughout your third year? So I wouldn't say it's like a dedicated study. You have your rotations, but you definitely should try to get through all the UWorld questions for that rotation during that rotation. I know sometimes it's hard because you're so busy, you don't get a lot of weekends off, and you're dealing with trying to get good recommendations and all this stuff, but make sure you get your questions done. Um, it's definitely doable, and it'll really put you in a good spot for step two. And unfortunately, like the schools still haven't really expanded their step two dedicated that much. So before, you know, all this stuff, you would get maybe two weeks, three weeks max for step two. And now this is the most important exam, right? You want longer than that, but you may not get longer than that just because of the way the school is structured and they haven't changed things quite yet. So I think it's even more important that you get through all the shelf questions during the year. So yeah, we kind of talked about pre-dedicated, that's the groundwork, and then dedicated is where we kind of focus on all of the questions. Okay, so I wanna, okay, let's, okay, so how long should I study for step two? What do you guys think? Any guesses? One month, okay, anyone else? Depends. Yeah, that's, that's the right answer for sure. Um, one month can also be right, depends on who, right? So if you study for two months, studying three times more gonna get you a better score? You know, not really. Maybe for someone, but not, not necessarily. So how much you should study I think really depends on if you've covered the content before. So if you cover all the shelf questions and have been scoring um, in the pass, uh, like to the pass to high pass range for your shelves, you should be probably pretty good in about four to six weeks for step two. If shelves were quite a bit of a struggle, maybe you didn't, uh, maybe you need to attempt a shelf a few times, uh, then I would, uh, plan for at least two months. And that can vary again. So, you know, if you don't study efficiently the first two months or you're doing research at the same time, right? Like what I'm talking about is six weeks of undivided attention on step two, just going through questions. Um, and let's see here, just talking about study schedules, right? So part about how long you need to study is also what you wanna get. So for step one, I tell my students, if you're trying to you know, apply it to something competitive and get a step two score of like 255, 260 plus, you wanna be in the range of what 240 was for step one to kind of cover the content. After about 240 on step one, uh, you don't really get much benefit um, on step two score advantages because you have covered most of the content and you're just out of nitty gritty details that are not gonna be tested on step two. Now, if your goal is to uh, you know, just get around the 50th percentile for step two, you know, that's a little different, but I still recommend you go for about a 240 on what it was for step one. Um, and as far as more short-term goals, during dedicated, 
I really think it's important to plan out every single day that you have. So if you have two months, that's 60 days, you have an Excel sheet, every single day is listed out, right? And you're gonna have, what questions are gonna do those days? So like two blocks random, right? And then maybe one subject block for which subject you put that in, right? Um, and then put down about weekly, which exams you're gonna take. So I actually like to start um, backwards with that. So your exam day, let's say, is December 31st. You want to take your full length final exam with seven blocks, step one, eight blocks for step two, about one week to 10 days before. Okay, don't do it too, too close to it because you won't have time to change if things go wrong. Um, and also, it's very exhausting. You'll realize that after a few days, you're still not fully recovered. So don't take that full length exam you know, the very same week of your actual exam. And then behind that, you know, you can take uh, NBME exams, which are about five blocks there, or four blocks, five hours. They're a little longer blocks. They're 50, block, or 50 questions and 40 questions. So I would do that, and then in that mix, throw in one of the UWorld uh, self-assessments as well. Um, and between each week, your goal is to see, to fix the mistakes you made the first on the first assessment, to not make those same things in the second assessment. Um, you kind of use those as like, you know, check boxes, uh, marker points to keep going. And uh, yeah, setting up a study schedule. So, you know, I can kind of read through the slide, but this is something you probably want to just take some uh, notes on or take a picture. Uh, but this is more of what you would do for a single day, okay? And one of the important things I like to talk about here is this thing called chunking. So chunking is, it's really hard to do the same task monotonously for the whole day. So if you're like, I want to review GI, reviewing GI for a whole hour or I mean a whole day is very hard. And you're probably going to zone out and you actually won't get through everything, even if you spend the whole day. So divide that GI task, say over three days. At the same time, you can review other subjects and you always do random questions. Okay, every day, kind of no matter what. Um, and if you switch tasks about every hour and a half or so, so maybe you do questions and then you go maybe videos, then you do Anki afterwards, go back to questions, that'll keep you engaged. And instead of taking uh, fewer breaks, take multiple short breaks. That really helps. So, you know, go for an hour exercise break. Take a break for every meal, take a break for a snack, you know, have a couple hours uh, for just other things that you didn't plan for. Uh, I think that's really helpful. And some common pitfalls here, okay? So I think some of the things I've seen is one, people are using too many resources. Uh, people are spending too much time on the exam. Um, they don't know when to stop studying. And oftentimes the questions aren't as hard as you think they are. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a tutor. I'm saying that because you yourself will see. Um, you're really busy looking at those details, but you realize that the, like once you look at the explanation, the answer is like, oh wait, this is so simple, I should have known that. Well, that's part of the reason, kind of look at the bigger picture. Imagine that patient was actually in your office. What would you do? Sometimes take your medical student or doctor hat off and you'll be able to see, oh wait, this is actually common sense. You don't even need to have gone to medical school for that question, right? So a lot of times the big picture, just knowing that some of them are common sense questions can help. Uh, and let's see here. Another important thing, don't use tutor mode too much, okay? There's a time and place for that. And that is really if you're reviewing ethics questions at the end, okay? So I recommend you go through about like all the AMBOSS ethics questions, especially for step two um, at the, like the week before your exam. Use tutor mode for that. Go through whatever, 200, 250 of them. Very high yield for the actual exam. Okay, those are the types of things you can use tutor mode for. Uh, and then, you know, another common issue is seeking help too late. You know, people often wait till a week before their exam. At that point, even if someone helps you change your study habits, it's very hard to um, have everything uh, get fixed in the time. So if you're realizing you're plateauing, you need some help, don't be afraid to ask. And you don't need to get a tutor. You may ask help from a friend, but, um, you know, Tutoring can sometimes be some of the most uh, helpful things 
out there. Well, I know we're almost out of time, but I want to open at least some time for some more questions. I know people have uh, a lot of questions here, so. Yeah. Um, can you expand a little on shelf exams? How do I prepare for them? Yeah. So. Or what would you? Or what did you? Yeah. So shelf exams. Uh, what I'd recommend is starting questions early, and try to do blocks of questions on the weekends, so of the U world. And oftentimes, certain rotations, they don't have that many questions, so it's hard. So at that point, you want to do some AMBOSS questions, and then try to do a few of the NBME self-assessments for the shelf. Those are much more representative. Um, but usually, they're, you know, if you do well on those, you'll have a pretty good idea, good idea at the shelf, but don't underestimate them. So yeah, yeah, yes. So don't underestimate them. So you'll be like, oh my god, they wouldn't put an actual exam, uh, actual question like that on the exam. Doesn't seem like it's easy, and then there'll be crazy ones on there. So it's pretty representative. Try to go off, go off that, and then definitely review the questions, kind of like we talked about. Um, well, yeah. And what would you say is better, uh, Amboss or U World for shelf exams? U World. U World is better. Yeah, I think U World. Like that, you. I recommend everyone gets U World for. So U World for step two is the same as shelf. Okay, it's not like a separate subscription, so you're gonna need it for step two anyway. So just yeah, yeah do that. And Amboss is you know an addition. It's also great, but I would recommend U World first. Yep. Hi. Um, thanks for all the tips. When you mentioned starting with a practice test, would that be the U World assessment, NBME, or NBME? So I would I would start with a NBME self assessment. Um, and for step one, yeah, you know, there's there's only two like U World self assessments. Okay, so there's usually like five to seven. Um, oh, did that a third? Okay. Um, so I don't know too much about the third one because uh, there's not been, I guess, well tested yet. But uh, the first two are good. Yep. Any anything else? Yeah. Do you have any advice um, for those still studying for step one? Um, if they go on pass fail and like national rates declining in pass rates. Yeah, so the I think obviously there's no exact answer to that question. We don't know, but what I would guess is what's happening is that people aren't putting the time early as people were before when it was scored, because they're like, oh, I just have to get you know what was like fifth percentile or tenth percentile before, and so I I took step one for a score, so. Within a couple of months of med school, we were studying, like everyone was studying for step one. And you know, you've studied like a year, year and a half for it. Like it's not dedicated, but you're focused more on that than school stuff. And then you do a dedicated for two months, sometimes extend it, and then you're ready. Most of the time now, people don't even start thinking about step one until their second year of med school and they're not really serious until a few months before dedicated. I think that's the reason. People just don't start early enough and incorporate it with their daily uh, school, school work. So if your school is not offering you world, and if you're not taking any of these during your first um, year or in the pre-educated period, what can you do as a student to like jump ahead on things? Yeah, so my, for example, my school didn't offer me any of the resources, so we had to, you know, pay for it, but I don't think in that case, I, I would say you can really wait for your world till the dedicated time, but I think having AMBOSS then will more than compensate for everything else. So if you just have one subscription of AMBOSS and you have a access to the sketchy videos or boards and beyond, and you go through those and you do some questions with AMBOSS, you're going to be great uh, for dedicated. All right. Okay, so I had a few more. Uh, closing slides. So, right, a lot of it is based on your own attributes, how, how much you want this. And uh, really, just be, it's, I think it's a lot more about consistency than how smart you are. So, be consistent. Give yourself time off. That's actually one of the things people don't do. Give yourself time off. It really helps. And you know, a little bit about med school coach. So the way that med school coach believes that 
know, we should do things, which I very much agree with, is you get this foundation, right? So this is the foundation you learn through school. This is what you start with pre-dedicated. And having a good study schedule that's efficient and then adding practice questions onto that and doing all of that well, repeating all of that well, and then doing that in a testing environment will get you uh, well prepared. And what we do at Med School Coach is really offer personalized help, okay? Because there's really no formula that fits everyone, okay? Because I've, I don't even know how many students, probably like at least 50 or 60 students just in, you know, USMLE uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Um, I really believe that everyone learns a bit differently, and there's some common issues I've seen, but everyone's a bit different. So personalization is, I think, one of the most important things, and having multiple different advisors you could be paired with is great, and really just having a great track record and having a team approach is something we pride, and pretty much the way this works, uh, if you ever need help, we would uh, just contact our enrollment team online, and we get you a free session, and if you like it, we get you paired with the tutor. And the way that works is you fill out a form, and we pair tutors uh, with students based on you know similarities and teaching methods. And uh, then you know you practice a lot, make sure everything is working according to schedule, and hopefully you get your score up. So yeah, that's a little bit about med school coach. Feel free to scan that code and. Uh, if no one else is here uh, for the next talk, I'm happy to answer a few more questions, um, either as a group or, you know, privately.